Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. We've got an amazing episode today for you. Yes, I know I always say that, but today is truly amazing because we had Bill Shahar on the episode, co-founder and CEO of Bittrex. The reason that it excited me to have Bill on the show, we've been good friends for a few years, is because Bittrex is one of the oldest and first exchanges to really usher in the whole trading and speculating on altcoins and how that came about. So we spent a lot of time talking about the founding of Bittrex, about how it happened and why they actually founded the company in those early, early, early years. We talked about like the differences between tokens and coins and how does Bittrex actually list a token? Like how do they do it? What goes on internally in their company when they're trying to get a token listed or you want to get your token or coin listed getting the perspective of the ico market and like the bull market in the past few years from the perspective of the ceo of one of the largest exchanges at that time and one of the exchanges that actually had the most altcoins trading on them in fact like nowadays you see on twitter as the joke like when binance like when are your exchange when is your token gonna get listed on binance but really bitrex pioneered that so it was originally when Bittrex and everyone wanted to get their coin and token listed on Bittrex. It wasn't Binance and Bittrex was around years before Binance. So if you really want to understand like how altcoins came to be, where Bitcoin falls into this, what happened in the ICO boom, what happened in the bear market and are we ever going to hit another bull market? This is an episode you want to listen to. Bittrex has more than 3 million customers globally and they know more information than you and I will ever know. Give some love to the sponsors. Talk to you guys right after the ads. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012. So they really, really put their money where their mouths are. U.S. customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com. Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. Told stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. A few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the Blockworks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. I'm very excited today to have Bill Shahara, the CEO and founder of Bittrex, on the show today. Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Bill, I have to tell you, um, your first business in crypto before Bittrex um, was called gift card BTC. And well, I don't even know if, can you call it a business? Um, and I wanted to tell you that actually when I first got into Bitcoin too, during those years, I did the exact same thing. I was selling gift cards for Bitcoin on Bitcoin talk forums. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty fun to do and, and get our, um, get our feet wet in the industry. And actually that was one of the impetuses for creating Bitrix. 
I mean, you can't really call it like an industry back then, right? It was just a bunch of kids. Yeah, yeah. Back then, uh, I mean, it's just incredible how far we've come right now in terms of where the industry is. But yeah, back then, um, you know, most trading was done. This was after Gox got hacked. A lot of trading was done on some pretty terrible websites. Uh, and, you know, there was this perception that most of them weren't safe. Like you couldn't figure out where some of these exchanges were based and who ran them. So um, even a company like Gift Card BTC, um, you know, we weren't really ready at that time to disclose who we were and what we were doing. We were just uh, just kind of dipping our toes in the water and trying to figure out uh, what was going on with crypto. You brought up an interesting point, and I've never actually made this point on the show before. And you, you just made a very good point. You said that we didn't want to tell people who we were. And so I'm, I'm loosely translating to that, too. And I remember those days that... Um, most, if not all, Bitcoin companies and Mt. Gox included, they didn't have pictures on their website of their staff. It just wasn't a thing, right? It wasn't. Um, you didn't have. Um, you didn't have team photos. There weren't bios. There weren't really even the names. Uh, even people were like reluctant to put it. You know, even put it on LinkedIn. And then you had that. That went on for years, and then. Um, it changed. Why, why did that change? And why were you and others uh, afraid or not willing or concerned about, in the beginning at least, um, having you know team bios or whatever? Well, I think with gift card BTC, we were just really just trying to understand the industry. And so um, I don't know that it was a concerted decision to not post our bios, but it just, I guess, never occurred to us that it mattered because that site was really small and niche. But when we created Bitrix, actually, we were the first exchange where we posted pictures of ourselves and our resumes. I remember and, that. That was that you were one of the first ones. Yeah. And uh, what was crazy about it is like we knew that to become a new exchange in the space, we had to instantly um, get trust with our users. And so we thought, well, since no one else was saying who they were and where they were located, we were just going to come out and tell people we were based in Seattle. You know, we used to have the Space Needle right on our, our website. And that, you know, this was done by Richie, Rami, and Bill. And what was funny about, I think, the, the very first beginnings of that is we thought that this was going to uh, generate a lot of... Um, of trust with the community, but what ended up happening is that people didn't believe it. So they said, like, there's no possible way that these three senior guys from, you know, Microsoft and Amazon were going to actually put their names on this website and, uh, and that these were real people. And so we had people like frantically Googling us. Um, you know, back then, it's, uh, you know, the most hilarious things started coming out, right? So they, they, uh, they doxed us on Bitcoin Talk, and the Bitcoin Talk moderators had to come in and like pull that stuff down. Like they had posted our our addresses and said uh, exactly, I think, what people feared at that time if they were going to go public about owning a Bitcoin company. So what happened to you? What you know, the doxing and all that stuff. It it happened, and and yeah. did you keep everything up anyways? We did. We kept it all up because um, we weren't afraid to tell people that you could trust us. And you could trust the security of the site. You could trust the performance of the site, and ultimately, you could trust the fairness of the site because our, you know, we're willing to put our names and reputations on this. And if you recall back then, like we were still working uh, full time at Amazon, so we were working full time at Amazon and part time on Bitrix when we launched Bitrix. Bitrix was just kind of a side project for us at the time, and so we were deathly scared actually that. If Bitrix ever got hacked, we would be completely unemployable in the security space. So, you know, we took we took Bitrix's security like incredibly seriously, not just because we cared about our users, but we realized like I had no future in the security industry if Bitrix got hacked. <laughs> you, Rami and 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 Richie came from came from Microsoft. You guys, how long have you guys, the three of you known each other? So Richie and I became friends, I think back in like 2003 or so, we've known each other for a really long time. And we worked and grew up in the security team at Microsoft together. Uh, Rami joined the team a few years later, but the three of us have known each other as like going on like 15 years for me and Richie and um, a little bit like about 12 years for Rami and I. I just have like one important question. Why, why did we stop using Windows XP? 
Like, why couldn't Microsoft <laughs> just be happy with XP and just that's it? Like, because, you know, everything else after that was never as good as XP. What what went on inside of Microsoft? What what? Tell us. Forget crypto for a second. I need to know. This has been bothering me for like fifteen years. Well, I'm so just teasing you. As the guy, <laughs> I, I worked and helped ship Windows XP, so I'm super psyched that you love it. It's um, not just me. As, it's like the whole world. As far as like the rest of it, like I, you know, <laughs> I wasn't part of any other launch of Windows, so it's hard for me to say what's going on there. So you really, you, you're lucky. I mean, you were part of not lucky, but you were part of Microsoft during, well, I guess, the reign of of XP. You know, we joke like every time there was a new operating system, it was like that. The, the, you know, the kingdom of or the reign of. You were there during the reign of it was, and that to me at least, um, if I like, I download Boot Camp to play Grand Theft Auto, I'm like using. Using XP or or a better you know something newer, but um, but it's interesting that you guys came from Microsoft from security and you've probably looked at exchanges back then and you've probably looking at exchanges over the course of the years with like a shaking of your head, saying like how could some of these other companies or how could how could these things happen? I mean, you even see hacks. That happened a few months ago, uh, two weeks ago. Um, how are these things still happening and, and why? Well, I think it's just because it's so hard, right? Like, I mean, if you think about us as an industry, we're taking a leading edge technology and trying to make it accessible for the average user. And it's really difficult. Like, I, I, I'd be lying to you if I, if I didn't tell you that, you know, every day at every day at Bittrex, we still think about security and we keep improving it because we know that. It's a never-ending uh, project that you always have to remain vigilant. People are coming up with new techniques every day to exploit the security of everyone's software. And so uh, it's an extremely hard problem. And, you know, I, I'd say the other thing is a lot of companies don't devote, devote the right amount of resources to it. You know, if, if it's not part of your DNA, if you're not training your employees about security, um, if you're not making that part of their jobs, then people will largely just forget about it. And you'll make, you'll make the wrong decisions that put your customer funds at risk. You were with Microsoft for years, BlackBerry and Amazon. And then you were building, you were, while you're working at Amazon, you're, you're building Bittrex. And the, co the companies that I just named are known for their security, um, the user interface, uh, the GUI, you know, Microsoft is the, Basically, what I my point is here that you you worked on user interfaces, you worked on security and privacy, and then you and then you you come into crypto, you come into Bitcoin, and we're talking about security and why it's important. And I agree with you that it's so important. But Bill, how do you how do you maintain security and privacy and like decentralization? Let me just lump the three of them together for a second. Or how do you maintain security and privacy, and how do those go up? But at the same time, how do you get user experience to continue getting better as well. Cause isn't it like where if, it, if one is greater than the other one cannot be. So I disagree that it's a zero sum game. Like I, I think that you can have great security and privacy and you can have great usability, but it's not an easy problem to solve. So in the case of crypto, you've got this public private key uh, for every address. And your private key has to be secured in the most rigorous way possible. And, you know, without a method of securing that private key would be, uh, you know, one of the impediments for my mom using crypto. You know, she's going to she's going to generate a public private key and she prints it out and, you know, tapes it to the side of her monitor or she uh, puts it in her email and forgets about it's it. It's too complicated. Right? Uh, I agree. So, but we're starting to see people building solutions that uh, are able to store your private keys in ways that are much more like how you currently secure your email or your Facebook account. So, you know, coming up with uh, with these with these vaults where um, you know mobile applications that vault your public and private key where it requires a password for you to type, one that you can remember, and a 2FA method, right? So I think we're starting to get closer and closer to the usability that people are already expecting from the sites that they're on today and applying those kinds of things 
to crypto. Now, there's another problem, I think, which uh, you know, we're still trying to solve, which is, uh, so my mom's got a public key and she wants to then, like, how do I send her $100 worth of Bitcoin because she's likely going to cut and paste that wrong when she sends it to me. Or even if she cuts and pastes it to me in a text message, then I got to put cut and paste that into some, uh, into a different app to be able to send her crypto. So I think, you know, there's going to, there, there are some efforts out there that also make that part of the user journey a lot easier as well. So I, I think, I think we're slowly and steadily getting better at the usability thing. And that's what it's going to take for us to reach significant mass adoption. Um, I've, uh, and, and I mean, you and I have been around for a really long time. You know, I got back into this thing in 2011. And in 2011, um, you know, Richie and I were doing like crazy things like having to pay for graphics cards to mine Bitcoin. I would, he'd find these guys on Craigslist selling graphics cards. And I go to the state park, not at midnight. So you had to meet people in parking lots at night to, to buy Bitcoin, <laughs> not even to buy Bitcoin, well, to buy graphics cards. Yes. This was to buy graphics cards to mine Bitcoin. And, and even back then, like if you wanted to buy Bitcoin um, and, and even in the Mt. Gox days, if you really wanted to buy Bitcoin, you're going onto Craigslist or you're going onto eBay and hoping somebody wasn't going to scam you. Like it, it's just, you know, as an industry, we've evolved so far away from where things were back then. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I think one of the reasons we created Bitrix was to really help the industry move in that direction, right? By shining a light on the people running the exchange, uh, being uh, much more plugged into uh, regulations and working with lawyers and working with uh, uh, you know good people and you know really raising the bar I think on our executive team and the kinds of people that we hired at the company. The world of crypto right now is so different than where it was when we first got in. It was and it, it is, and I want I, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna we're gonna go into it. But I just want to ask you really quickly, did, did those people that you were buying from, did they ask you why you were buying graphics cards? Like, were they curious? Um, well, most of the guys that we bought graphics cards from were people who were mining. So they would okay. upgrade to the latest version and they'd give us the N minus, you know, they'd sell us the N minus one versions. So we were always kind of behind the curve, but really what we were trying to do is just understand how blockchain technology worked. And, and we were just lucky enough for Richie and I each mined 200 Bitcoins apiece. So wow. we, we, we got in back then, we bought, mined, I think, 200 Bitcoins apiece back when it was worth uh, like $12 a Bitcoin or something. So we broke even. We broke even on these graphics cards and the electricity that we were paying. And I thought to myself, like, great, you know, it's all gravy from now on. And then Bitcoin price crashed and my Bitcoin was essentially worthless. And I said to Richie, like, you know, this is stupid. Like, I think Bitcoin's a fad. You know, let's get out of this thing. Where I'm, I'm done. I'm not mining any more Bitcoin. I bought, I took all my bar mitzvah money and I bought Bitcoin at $32. $32 and then the price went to 36 And I was like, so excited. I was telling my parents. And then it dumped. Remember when I got like $2? I lost mm -hmm. all my bar for money. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of where I was mentally, where uh, you know the price dumped down, and I just thought this is this sucks, this is stupid. Yeah, this fucking Bitcoin so, thing. Fuck this thing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so well, but here's the travesty of it, right? So two years later, in 2013, Richie says to me like, "Hey, do you still have this Bitcoin?" And of course, I say no. It's long gone. Um, and and he's like, "Well, Bitcoin's about to hit a thousand dollars of Bitcoin." And that was around the time where we said, like, okay, well, we need to get back into this thing again. And, but man, I, I'll tell you, like, it's the sickest feeling when you know that you just flushed two hundred thousand dollars down the toilet. And <laughs> and, uh, and 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 this is how sick, like, even worse it was. It was a concerted. It was like a conscious decision. So. In, I think the year after Richie and I mined the Bitcoins, so probably 2012, I'm throwing away this laptop. And there's a directory on there with my public private key in it. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm, I don't need this. So I'm just going to throw this away. What do you mean you don't and need so you, this? 
Well, like I, I just thought like I hadn't been keeping up with Bitcoin. So I thought it was like probably worth like less than a penny each. Right. So I said, you know, we're going to I'm going to do the what a good security person does is I do the NSA wipe of my hard drive and then I throw it into the landfill. And so those 200 Bitcoins, thank you, everyone. Or, you know, you can thank me, anyone else who holds Bitcoin. But those 200 Bitcoin are never recoverable. It's, it's gone. How many, how many Bitcoins do you really think are lost out there? You think it's in the millions? I think so. It's got to be. Like, I mean, there's just got to be people like me who did stupid things with them. I, I mean, I could tell you two stories of when I did that. One time I sent um, 50 Bitcoin as a, as, a, as a tip on YouTube. And you can actually see the comments of me sending the... Uh, Sent, I sent the artist 50 instead of five because he had created a, a theme song for, for BitInstant. So I sent him 50 Bitcoin instead of five. And I was like, yeah, just keep it. Because we're talking about like $100, a few, a few hundred dollars versus like $100 or something like that. So I'm like, just keep it. It's yours. And then, yeah, same thing like you. One other time I had like that, hundreds probably. And I sent it to a friend and and he lost it. it, but we were sitting next to each other. So I still till today. I don't know why I think I figured out what happened. I think he didn't have, and this was my, my knowledge of Bitcoin. Every, all my, all our listeners are going to make fun of me right now, but fuck them. Um, no, no, I'm just joking. I love you guys. Um, the blockchain wasn't downloaded. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was sending the balance. I, I think I kept, I think I resent, I think I sent him Bitcoin like five times in that sitting. I was like, why are you not getting this? And I was like, this thing is stupid. It doesn't work. It's broken. Fuck you, Satoshi. I'm going home. And yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. I, know. I remember those days when you'd launch the Bitcoin wallet and you'd have to let it sink for like a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Ethereum now. <laughs> oh, now no. I'm going to get all the Ethereum trolls on me. I'm just joking. Um, um, I want to just fast forward really quickly. We talked about like the state of the industry today uh, for a second. Um, and we talked about, you know, security. You you come from a very big security background, your partners and your team. Um, are you concerned or are you concerned at all with with the perception or I guess the messaging that I'm seeing now and the messaging over the past like six months maybe or the year has been you know, Bill, it used to be, and, and you know, it was probably exchanges themselves who said this, but it used to be, um, don't keep money on exchanges, deposit, trade, withdraw, right? You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Yep. Um, we definitely told people to do that. And, and but that's what everyone did. That was just, it was good practice, you know, good, it's good practice. But now, and maybe I shouldn't be concerned and, and that's okay, but I, I kind of am, I feel like the messaging has changed to this whole distributed finance thing. Um, it's deposit money on the exchange, leave your money here. We'll do staking. We'll do, um, you could do, you could borrow, you could borrow dollars against your Bitcoin. You could borrow Bitcoin against your dollars. You could, all of these products, suites and tools are great. And they're being launched by, uh, these distributed financial companies or, you know, exchanges themselves. And it seems like the exchanges are doing them. So I guess my question is a very long winded question. What do you think about that? Do you have any plans for anything like that, like staking or lending? And do you think we should be doing that? Is it, is it safe? I think the industry is always going to have a hybrid approach to it where there will be, you know, some people who want to be completely in possession of their keys completely in possession of the coins. They want to have their own wallets, uh, whether it's hardware wallets or software wallets. They're going, they want to keep control of everything. And I think that is, um, I think that is, that used to be the majority of people, um, but I don't think that's where the space is anymore. Like if you think about how difficult it is for you to manage all of the technology of the blockchain and be like a trading guru and be able to trade successfully or keep on or be a research guru and be on top of every project that's out there it's a monumental task for anybody and there are a few people out there who are incredible at this but the the i think the average person out there um is really only going to have the time to uh to be good at one or two things and maybe only be good at one or two blockchains. and so i i don't think this world where um, 
people are are or or a majority of users won't keep their uh, coins in an exchange or bank or any of these kind of centralized places. I think I think that's just where the industry is going to go. Um, now, having said that, you know, are we doing more to to make it valuable and make it a win-win for customers to hold their coins on the exchange? The answer to that is yes. And you know how we tackle that problem and how we how we provide value is that a problem though? I mean, exchanges want it, I guess, right? Because there's the products they can make money off of. Yeah, it, well, I, I think as a problem for users, I think users just need to understand the track record and uh, make the proper risk-based decisions um, when they choose to store or leave their funds on any centralized place, whether that's an exchange or a bank or um, an online wallet of some kind, like wherever they, wherever they choose to put their funds, users need to be able to do the proper research and make the right, the right risk-based decisions. And, um, you know, if they're doing that, then I don't have a problem with them storing their funds um, in any of these centralized spots. So it's additionally not only on the exchange or the company, but the user itself of crypto, there's a responsibility for the user to make sure that they're following the right security protocols. But in, I guess in that sense of the word, are we ready? Is Bitcoin, is, crypt, is crypto ready? Like, I don't know if I want to be able to tell my grandmother that she has to worry about these type of things. I mean, uh, maybe we're not ready for that. I think we're still on the leading edge here that we're still like as an industry, we're still innovating. And I would agree with you. Like, I, I don't think, uh, you know, this, the space is ready for my mom or maybe, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to inflict my mom on this space, I guess, but you know, but it's definitely she, not on crypto Twitter. She's not, you know, she's not ready and crypto isn't ready for her yet, but do I see a path? And am I super bullish on the fact that everybody in the world can get access to crypto and use it safely? I absolutely am. And I think that's going to happen sooner rather than later. Speaking of, of, uh, of tweets, who writes Richie's tweets? Richie writes his own tweets. Like, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he's a, he's, he is a master of the pun. What can you, what are your favorite ones? Um, do you remember? Well, I'm trying to remember some, I can't remember any offhand. So They're so what funny. I, what I, what I will share um, because Richie's going to hate for me to share this, is my favorite tweets are not necessarily from Richie, but the tweets that people have submitted uh, for Richie. And so Richie's got, you know, back in, I think, 2015, there was a little meme that we started uh, for Richie, uh, where people would post Richie's picture with some, uh, with a little inspirational quote under it. And uh, no, I got to see this. And, and those are probably some of my favorites. Um, we have uh, Richie has periodically run some contests where he'll ask people to submit some, uh, you know, funny tweets for him to, uh, you know, f or funny puns for him to tweet. Um, but he, please open that up to the public, <laughs> please. But he, he's done that would be so funny. He, he, he largely does them by himself. And in fact, um, he will spend sometimes spend more time thinking about the tweet than actually the integration and launching of the blockchain. You know, some of the blockchains are super simple for us to integrate. You know, if it's an ERC twenty token or something, like it's really easy for us to turn trading on for an ERC twenty token. So he'll spend hours and hours ideating about the pun. So for those of you who think he just rattles these things off easily. Uh, I just want the entire viewership and the entire crypto universe to know that Richie cares about you guys so much that he will devote hours thinking about the puns for Bitrix lunches. It's it's things like this that it makes like it makes me smile or makes our industry awesome. <laughs> um, I think I was following him just just so I can, and I didn't even know what the coins or the tokens were. Sometimes I just wanted to see what you know he would write. Um, but speaking of of coins and tokens. When you guys launched, do you remember what were the first trading pairs that you guys had? And then how do they change over time? So, uh, gosh, I think we started with 11 tokens when we first launched. And there were like, we went and looked at coin market cap. And we just picked the top 10 or 11 tokens. So it was 
Okay, no, because I want to go. I want to go through this. So I got my paper and pen here. I'm not gonna actually like write down the names, but so this was like what 2013. Uh, it was we launched in um, we launched our beta at the end of February of 2014. Okay, so you're looking at you're looking at um, the the top <laughs> ones like Bitcoin. You had, you had, you had Namecoin, Dogecoin, Purecoin, uh, yeah, Litecoin. Uh, yeah, Litecoin, Dogecoin. Um, Gosh, I don't even remember. Like many of, not not all of them, but uh, many of them are dead now. I'd say half are still alive. I'd but. say more more than half are dead or not anything. Okay, but so that so that was like the first, I guess, wave. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, what would you call that? Like what all the if you were to lump all those tokens, all those coins, because there wasn't token yet; it was coins. If you were to lump kind of those coins into a category, what would they? be? B with is, is it more of like mineable coins or, or I guess some of them were, were proof of stake though right? Yeah, back then these were no actually I don't think there were any proof of stake coins back then. So hmm. what we initially launched with I believe were all proof of work um, coins, and I think many of them were ASIC mineable. So um, it was just I, I think it probably was things like um, I don't know Earth coin, you know. Uh, that, that kind of stuff back then where they were, um, you know, literally just small tweaks on the Bitcoin code. You know, as time progressed, though, bigger and bigger changes happened to the original Bitcoin code base. And then we started to see much more innovative things. So Blackcoin and and uh, Proof of Stake and, you know, uh, other other types of other types of mechanisms kept coming out and were really interesting and uh, and that's really I, I think you know what our passion for Bitrix is is really finding the most interesting technology or business models on the blockchain and trying to launch markets for them. And I think you've kept that mantra over the years, um, launching coins and tokens that others hadn't yet because you found them and they were super interesting to you. You helped create a market and then eventually. The markets got got bigger and, and got you know and were created, um, and so you had those early coins in 2014. What do you remember as being the transition from that those type of coins? Were there any like stories or time periods or first coins that you almost said to yourself, "Okay, we're now we're like moving away from the Bitcoin clones into something else"? Well, so we've always had this. Um this kind of model where, you know, we weren't traders, right? And, and you know, even though we were, I think, part of the crypto community, we really weren't traders. Like, we didn't, we didn't understand trading. We didn't, um, you know, like, we didn't have Wall Street backgrounds or, or you know, trade and day trade stocks or anything like that. So, um, you know, our mantra always was, like, it's not our job to figure out what is or isn't viable. Let's just go find stuff that's interesting and let's let the let's let our user base and the industry decide what is or isn't worthy, um, you know, to to uh, to succeed. And so we thought, okay, let's just keep going and finding new stuff. And and so I think you know the biggest change. I think the biggest change was really um, was Ethereum, right? Because up until that point, there were there were ICOs, but. They were different, though. We didn't call them that. Yeah, yeah, right. They weren't called ICOs, and they were just very different, right? They were um, they were private sales where you, you know, um, I, I think Ethereum was probably the last that was like this, where you would send somebody Bitcoin and hope to God they were going to send you something back, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, um, you know. I'm still waiting for my Butterfly Labs, by the way. Oh, oh, you, Me too. Me too, buddy. <laughs> So, you know, Stephen Pear from BitPay also, I spoke to him. He's still waiting too. Yeah, Richie and I lost money on that too. But anyway, oh, but, so we, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but but you're, I, I think it was really um, when Ethereum happened, I think there was this idea in people's minds that you could start doing fairly large raises on good ideas. And, and so, you know, Eventually, this became smart contracts and ERC-20 tokens. But even before that happened, I think there were people starting to look at what Ethereum did and say, wow, I think I think we can um, do something special with our technology ideas. But even so, I think Ethereum was serious. You know, it was a 
It was a, it was a serious undertaking. But if you were to ask like some of the earlier people that that bought in the Ethereum crowd sale, um, myself included, a lot of a lot of my friends, you know, I think it, um, if you were to ask someone who bought in the Ethereum crowd sale, you know, what are your expectations for this? And if you had asked that same question to someone who bought a token in 2017, I think the answers would be very different, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think people probably would have said, like, I'm taking a flyer and I'm hoping that Ethereum uh, is a cool technology versus, you know, in 2017, people had the expectation that everything was going to, you know, 100 X. But um, actually, you, you reminded me of something about really the um, like the older days of crypto when we first started. You know, the, a lot of the tokens that we, I was just talking about, you know, the initial 11 and probably the first probably 200 that we'd listed on Bittrex um, in the first couple of years. You know, and when I look back on that, I think back to what crypto was like for even on for the developers, where it was one or two guys working in their garage uh, with this passion of changing the world. And uh, now, you know, you launch an ICO and you've got 50 people on your team or 100 people. Right. And so I think the scale at which people tackle blockchain now is very different. But back in the day. Um, oh, I never thought about that. You're it, right. Yeah. Back in the day, it's be like one guy or two guys. And, and yeah, you know, I'll tell you, even even the users that traded on the user base or, or, or on the exchange, you know, I'll tell you the proudest moments of mine when it comes to Bitrix are, you know, when when we've got tokens on the exchange from back in 2014 or 2015. There's just a few handful of them now where these guys are still cranking away. They're bigger teams now, more serious. But I remember when it was one guy or two guys in a garage. And, but not just them, but when I think about our users, there are guys that um, changed their lives because of crypto, where they were college kids, um, not sure what they were gonna do with their lives. They got into crypto and they would tell me, I paid off. I paid my way through college because I made a hundred grand the first year I was trading crypto, or, um, or even more impressively, there are people who are college kids trading on Bitrix back in 2014, who have come back to me in 2016 and 2017, and even till now, who've come back and said like, "Hey, because I got my start trading crypto on Bitrix, I've now been, I've now created my own fund. I'm now trading crypto professionally." not just in my dorm room. I'm actually doing it professionally um, with other people's money or uh, with the backing of some financial company. And it's their career to trade crypto. And, and so those are the kinds of things where I look back on what we did back in 2014. And I mean, I, I just, it, that stuff makes me smile and just like keeps me uh, motivated to keep working on Bitrix. And it's probably not going to stop. I mean, you're going to have people constantly coming to you guys over the next few years. And it's something you should be proud of because it definitely changed people's lives. And and Bill, I have to I have to give you a confession. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. U.S. customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade, with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything, and that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com. Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. And Bill, I have to I have to give you a confession as well. Um, I never traded on Mt. Gox. Um, 
our company, BitInstant, would buy its Bitcoins from Mt. Gox, and we had APIs to do that. But I never, I would, you know, I'm, I was never a good trader. I'm still not a good trader. I'm too emotional. I love Bitcoin. I love crypto. So I love it. I'm, I'm I feel guilty shorting Bitcoin. How about that? Stupid. <laughs> I know. Um, but I will tell you this, and the data backs it up. I think Bitrex was the first exchange I ever traded on. Man, I appreciate uh, hearing that. So I think it's probably the only ex- exchange I ever really traded on. Um, really, like like that, I like the best, I guess. Well, what drew you to it? Like, what was what was the thing that um, got you to trade on Bitrix? The simple UI. I didn't even have to think about it. Um, very very simple because it creating an account. I remember I remember very specifically going back years ago. I. I and and you you may have to check when I actually opened up my account, but if I were to guess, I'm gonna say it's somewhere like in the 2016, 2015, 20 maybe yeah around that time. Um, but what drew me to it was how simple the user interface was, but at the same time, um, how you know how many features you had when you had first launched, and and it was very different back then. But um, I'm not a trader, like I don't know how to trade, but I still like dabbling in altcoins. And I think a lot of people do. So I'm going to ask you a question that I never really thought about before. And um, I'm actually unsure if I should ask it, but who cares? Um, Do you think, do you think that trading, um, you think that if it wasn't for altcoins, if it wasn't for altcoins, and I don't use the word altcoins in like a negative light, by the way, I, I, it's simply alternative to Bitcoin. That's just what I've been saying for years without, imagine a world where altcoins never existed. Imagine a world where like, it was just Bitcoin and like, that's it. Or like maybe a few little things. Do you think trading and speculation and exchanges would they be here today? Would it would it be a big deal? Hell, would the price of Bitcoin have ever get into have it, would have ever gone to twenty thousand dollars without altcoins even existing? So I think the answer to that is is uh, yes. Like I, I think you know if you look at Bitcoin itself, I think it's a, it's unique enough and has enough um, use cases where I think it can truly stand on its own. And I actually think that's true of not just Bitcoin, but other projects in the space as well. Um, I think so. I, I think the industry um, would still exist if there were only a few example blockchains out there, and there were only a few use cases. But um, but I think I myself might not be in the space. And the reason I say that is, you know, if it, I come back to my passion around blockchain and the technology itself. Like the reason I get excited about about Bitrix and about uh, the industry that we're in is that every day it feels like there's a new use case that's being sprung up or a new way people are thinking about using blockchain and decentralization. And and so I think we would still have trading, we would still have exchanges, we'd still have people using Bitcoin if it was just Bitcoin out there. But I'd f- but it feels like the world would be poorer for that. What do you mean by that? Well, I just feel like people wouldn't be like, it, to me, that means people haven't been experimenting the way that they have been on blockchain and decentralization. And you know, new consensus mechanisms, or proof of stake, or um, new encryption algorithms, or um, you know, or smart contracts, and you know, the ideas of putting land deeds on a blockchain, or the idea of having immutable blogging, or you know, putting your identity on a blockchain. You know, all of these ideas. Um, I think if there weren't innovators out there pushing this technology forward and thinking about those things. Like, I, I really feel like we'd be in a poorer place right now, like, uh, overall. Like, I, I just, you know, I, I just don't think that the blockchain industry itself would be as excited and energized if it was just Bitcoin. It's like the whole industry has to throw shit at the wall to see what sticks. But if people aren't throwing, then we don't know what will stick. Exactly. I, I think I agree with you. Um, I really do. I think I think I agree with you on this. And... We've come a long way and it's nice to see that you're not jaded. It's nice to see that after, you know, 
uh, you know, we're, it's like, look, can we can we just say like a decade? It's so much easier. I can, I'm tired of counting the actual <laughs> months and years. Um, in the past almost a decade, um, it's nice to see that you're not jaded because some people do get that way. But it's also nice to see that you still like really cool shit. What's 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 like the coolest um, consensus mechanism? Because I geek out on consensus algos. I think they're like so freaking cool. Some of them. Although they'll never work, some of them, but I still think they're cool. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think mean, DPoS is cool. I think that that whole concept of 21, almost direct direct democracy, but there's a lot of flaws with that. So that's the problem with these consensus algos is that they have these fatal flaws that render them almost impossible to succeed long term, but they, they almost launch anyways. Yeah, well, again, it, it comes back to what you're saying where you have to throw stuff on the wall. So. I think um, if we didn't experiment with these things that, um, like this is the wonderful thing about Satoshi's white paper, right? Satoshi had these uh, economic notions around what proof, uh, what proof of work could mean and, uh, and how proof of work would secure and police the blockchain. But if he had never released the software, we would never know if his ideas were stupid or not, right? And, and so the block, blockchains are ways for us to test these really outrageous, you know, what, what could potentially be really outrageous, but if they're successful, world-changing ideas. And you get that feedback so quick. You know, it, it's um, people are going to be out there trying your consensus algorithm and trying to break it. Like it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's part of, I think, the ethos of, of, uh, of blockchain for us to all be a little skeptical about new ideas that are presented, but give them a chance and then try to break them. So, so where's the line for maximalism? Um, well, I mean, I'm not a maximalist or, you know, it's, not, so neither good. am I. Yeah, no, I don't believe in really labels and it's things like that, but who knows? Yeah, I, I think, I think we're just not yet at the end of the innovation curve. Like, I, I think that, you know, the perfect uh, consensus algorithm, the, the perfect blockchain doesn't yet exist, but there are many experiments out there that are going to tell us how we need to evolve to create something uh, that will be. Um, you know, like even, I mean, and, and so, you know, even a company like Bitrix, you know, we're not sitting around... Um, without evolving ourselves, right? Like we were, well, one of the things that we've done over the past couple of years is we've turned Bitrix from being a trading platform to something that's a much more open platform for other businesses to build on top of. So we have other exchanges who build on top of the Bitrix platform all over the world. And, you know, they get to take advantage of our security and the performance of our trading engine uh, while they get to build their own local businesses on top of blockchain. And, and this is not just trading uh, or like exchange venues, although we have a lot of them. We've got partnerships in, uh, in uh, South Africa, South America, Canada. There's a Bitcoin ATM company that I have, I've invested in that uses Bittrex for sourcing their liquidity. That's because right. Because of the so APIs. We, uh, we spend a lot of time cultivating all these partnerships around the world. Um, and I think a lot of that is also the, the legacy of our ethos coming out of Microsoft. You know, we know that um, for the entire industry to succeed, we all have to be working together. So instead of us trying to compete with everyone by building this giant vertical uh, solution in the space, instead we said, well, let's take what we're really good at. We're really good at building this high performance matching engine. We're really good at securing tokens and supporting a lot of tokens. So let's build APIs and allow people to use that infrastructure. So we have, um, you know, if, if you want to store Bitcoin in a custom or crypto in a custom solution, but you don't want to handle the complexity of managing all the blockchains, you can do that with Bitrix. Um, we have a partner, uh, Unicorn, where they have a casino cage where you can deposit a handful of different cryptos, like whether it's Bitcoin or Litecoin, Ripple, uh, things like that, and it will convert into their native token. And you gamble their native token on their platform, but when you withdraw, you can withdraw in their token or any other token out of their platform. And that's, that 
sort of casino cage where they can accept any crypto and let you deposit it, that's powered by Bittrex. And so that's, you know, there's just examples like this where we're really trying to partner with people across the ecosystem and let them build the businesses and the experiences that they're super good and passionate about without having to worry about all the complexity of handling tons and tons of blockchain. It's your, it's your, you know, ethos. It's your, it's your mantra. It sounds like to support companies, tokens, projects, communities. I mean, a whole many industries within our industry. Um, and so you're opening yourself up to speaking with, meeting with, uh, engaging with probably hundreds, probably thousands of different people and companies. Do you have any stories for us of like some weird ones and just the ones that you were like, laughed in- internally and said, like, I can't believe I'm sitting here right now? Well, I'll, I'll give you some data first, and then we'll go into like a specific example that just really tickled my brain when you asked this question. So, um, you know, Bittrex only lists probably about 1% of all the, the projects that apply. So, uh, you know, you can imagine what that funnel looks like because we're always sifting through uh, projects and sometimes projects can be legitimate, but probably, but not necessarily ready for an exchange. Maybe the technology isn't mature enough, and you know we're worried that it's just going to completely break. Um, and then oftentimes there are scams. But uh, there's one that I can recall, and I'm going to give a shout out to uh, uh, Alex Turkey and uh, and to the Decentral team in Vancouver, where um, there was a guy. Uh, he, you know, he was pitching like something called Cabbage Coin to me, and I think his company was called Cabbage Tech or something. And uh, you know, he wanted to he wanted to get his coin listed on Bitrix, and he was promising all these like agricultural and farm deals across the United States, and that this was going to be the de facto way that people were going to buy their tractors and and sell their lettuce or something. Anyway, so um, so we ended up. And so I ended up saying like, well, you know, like it sounds interesting, but, you know, I, it just sounded like it was just too big of an idea for what I perceived to be like one guy to be successful at. So I said, you know what you should do is like, you should go see um, the Decentral in Vancouver. They've got this podcast and they showcase a lot of blockchain projects. You should get on this podcast and you should talk about your project because even if you don't get listed on Bitrix, this will get more people um to review your project and potentially uh, trade it someplace else. So the guy shows up onto the uh, onto the onto the podcast in what looks like his basement, uh, wearing a Guy Fox mask, and <laughs> um, and you know as you can imagine, the interview completely goes off the rails from there. And uh, and and so I think people can Google this thing and find that interview and take a look at it. I have to see that. And, I have uh, to see it. I'm going to link to it. But that is, that's, that's just like probably for me, one of the crazier examples, right? Where, um, you know, it, it just ended up being like a total scam. But, um, and, and, you know, we had an inkling that it was a scam and, but, and, and, you know, thankfully the, or, or, you know, in cooperation, the community stepped up to out it as a scam. So, um, you know, really, really, I think, fascinating and interesting stuff like that's happened along the way. Um, but uh, but that's to me is like one of, I think, one of the more blatant kind of like scams yeah. that we saw. Uh, and that was an early one. That was before 2017 and 2016 when there was like an ICO craze. This was like a very, very early kind of scam that was trying to be done. The The whole, you know, the whole token listing process is uh mysterious and so when you're telling these stories i'm almost asking myself you know um as a user as a user of crypto um one of the most if you ask one of what's the most mysterious things you about crypto today i think a lot of people will tell you the answer is how tokens and coins get listed on exchanges you've been able to um maintain um the, over the years, and I, and I don't know how you, you've done it, you've been able to maintain a, a, a careful balance of listing some really, really good projects, um, but not projects that would be able to afford like a $200,000 payment that you're seeing nowadays in this token listing process. How do you feel about how that's evolved with your um, 
sister companies or competitors, however you look at them, how do you guys do it internally? And do you think that it's going to, you know, that whole token listing thing will exist in a few years from now? I think it will. And, and so, you know, our token listing process, I think, first and foremost, is about innovation. And, and so for you to make it through the first gate and for us to consider you at all, you have to demonstrate to us that you are uh, innovative either in the technology that you have. So you've innovated on blockchain in some way, or you've, uh, you have an innovative use case of a blockchain for your business. And so that's, I think, the first step to getting listed onto Bittrex. If you don't pass that gate, there's no chance of, of reaching any of the other gates. Now, the second gate is we have to feel, you know, like in a 50-50 chance that your project can be successful, right? So Only 50-50? Well, you know, it, it's, I, I felt like if we tuned it like to think only things that would be automatically successful, we would have no tokens on the exchange. If we were, uh, because remember, we're all on the leading edge here, right? Everything's a brand new experiment. And the second thing was that now, if we wanted to hold true to our principles and let the industry and our users decide what projects were viable, we had to create markets for stuff. And, and again, remember, we, we kind of are, you know, we, we just throw stuff on the wall. Like you find something that's innovative, we want the community to decide whether this innovation is viable or not. So, so you know, if, but, but a, an extreme example here would be somebody trying to pitch us the next version of Ethereum and it's three plumbers from New Jersey. Like, um, you know, if, if you don't, if you're trying to build the next Ethereum and innovate on smart contracts, you better show us how many PhDs you've got on your staff. But, and, and so that's kind of the thing that we look at in the second gate. It was, you know, more about who the project is. And then obviously certain people backing projects that we knew were scammers or habitual pump and dumpers just got projects blacklisted. And then, you know, the, the, the third, the third criteria then is like the compliance check. So we, um, it's different in the United States versus in Bitrix Global uh, or Bitrix International when it used to be Bitrix International. But you know, they there are compliance gates that we use um, to ensure that we're legally comfortable trading that token uh, in the United States or in the case of Bitrix Global, uh, they're they're an independent company based out of Liechtenstein. They have their own criteria that they use with the regulator in Liechtenstein to determine whether a project can be traded there. So, you know, the, the, but we do check for compliance. And, and so, you know, but if you think about, you know, outside of that, if you think about applying that process back in 2014, in 2014, 2015, and even 2016, as we mentioned, these are guys in their garage, right? These are people who believe or in- Our parents' basements too. Right. Don't forget about that. <laughs> But these are people who are passionate about uh, decentralization, passionate about blockchain, who had an innovation that they that they created and stamped onto a blockchain. But these guys didn't have money. Like there are to this day projects that are still traded on Bitrix who had no pre mine, who who um, who still work on these projects because they're passionate about them, not because they're directly. Um, you know, getting paid by them. And so, you know, back in 2014 and 2015 and even 2016, there's just no way that we could have charged anyone to get listed on Bitrix because the projects that were the most innovative, that we we're the most passionate about, couldn't afford to get, couldn't afford to pay any listing fee at all. Yeah. I mean, there's a funny joke today I heard that says, uh, says that most of the exchanges today would never have listed Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin couldn't afford to pay, you know, the mm -hmm. listing fee or whatever. Um, but how do you, I guess, internally, how do you sort? You know, you said 1%, right? So how do you even, you don't have the manpower to look at all those projects to see which ones even would go to the first step. Do you have like an automated system uh, or do you really ha do have someone looking through like every single submission? Yeah, we have a team of people. So wow. it's... It's uh, yeah, you know, the company has grown a bit since it was just Richie, Rami, and I. But there are there are a team of dedicated individuals who are really plugged into the community at large, and they look at and review every submission that comes in through the door. And um, you know, and and this is this is something, and and I'll say that this is potentially like a a criteria that we do look at. 
sometimes good projects don't make the first cut. And sometimes it's because maybe the way that they presented it to us, you know, that we asked people to write, you know, a paragraph describing the project, maybe the way that they originally presented it to us was not necessarily, you know, just didn't seem innovative. Um, so because we, we will look at, you know, what they describe their project as, we'll look at their websites, we'll look at their GitHubs, you know, we'll see what the commits look like and stuff. And, and so, you know, sometimes a project when they first approach us, um, you know, for some reason didn't put their the right foot forward, or maybe we made a mistake in passing it over too quickly. Um, so I love it when you see people like a few months later reapply because you know, there were some teams that reapplied consistently every two months for like probably a period of a year. <laughs> every two days, probably. Well, you know, we won't look at it if it's every two <laughs> days. We tell people once you get rejected, you know, come back in a few months. But, you know, it's, it, it is something telling when you see a project keep trying to get listed a year later, because, you know, you know that they've been working, they've been grinding, and, and that does carry some weight. We, we, we do look at that because I want to know who's in this thing for the long haul, right? There are a lot of people who are trying to make money very quickly in the space, but who's got the ethos that says, despite any hurdle, I'm going to keep going because I believe in my project and I believe in what's happening. So, you know, I, I would say to people that even if your project doesn't make the first cut, um, if you believe in it, we want to believe in you. So, you know, keep, uh, keep working with us. I had heard I had heard a rumor that you I heard heard a rumor that you waged a bottle of McAllen twenty five with Richie and Rami. Um, if they could build Bitrex in eight weeks, then you'd give them the <laughs> bottle of McAllen. So I thought, did they get the bottle? I don't know. I, I didn't hear that part of the rumor. <laughs> so uh, well, one I did give them the bottle, but two I want to make super clear. That they did not make the eight weeks. So Oh, they didn't. No, Richie, Richie, when he tells the story, will tell me that he made the eight weeks, but they did not make the eight weeks. Um, but I gave them the bottle anyway because I think they came in nine weeks. So and 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 you know, it was so the way that this was all divvied up, by the way, is that Richie wrote all the security and all the procedures and all of the storage methods that we use for the blockchains, right? So he is the blockchain guru. Okay. And Rami was the backend guru. He wrote high performance systems for Microsoft and for other companies that he worked at. So he was the guy who built the matching engine and why the performance of the matching engine is so incredible. And what I, what I got was the short straw and I ended up writing the UI because out of the three of us, we'd all spent most of our careers being C++ programmers and being backend guys. None of us knew anything about JavaScript or HTML. I had to learn how to code the site on the fly, on a fly. Uh, um, was it Bootstrap? Was that the first UI? The first UI used Bootstrap. Badly. See, that's why I loved it because it was ah. Bootstrap. But the the so I don't know if you remember Bitcoinica used Bootstrap too. Coinbase used Bootstrap. Everyone did use Bootstrap. Um, but um, I remember it didn't. The connections for like the other, it didn't work. So you'd have like on Bitcoinica, you'd have to hit trade like four times. Like it didn't. <laughs> so I, not you asking me why I like Bitrex. That's what I remember now. It was so simple. It was it was Bootstrap, but everything worked really well in the background. Um, but, but I'll take credit I mean, for why that. Did, why did you guys? Why did you guys start? I mean, I start. So I started a bit instant because simply there was no way to in a retail system, you know, to buy Bitcoin. There was no way to buy Bitcoin except for Mt. Gox. Like that's just what or a trade hill. And and I learned that I don't want to buy Bitcoin from an exchange. I want it to be a simple, quick process. And I don't want to buy thousands of dollars with I wanted a few hundred dollars. So that's why we started BitInstant. Did you have like similar issues with the industry? Were you <clears> trying to do something that you couldn't do to start? That's where I'm trying to, that's where my only gap is. Once I get that answer, we can end the show. I just don't understand that. <laughs> so... <laughs> When we were, um, so back when we created gift card BTC, well, I'll, I'll tell you two reasons why we created Bitrix. One, I think is going to give you the practical answer uh, that you're looking for, which is when we originally created gift card BTC, we were looking for a way to allow people to pay in other cryptos that was not Bitcoin. Like, so you could send us Bitcoin and we would convert it 
uh, using Coinbase's APIs to dollars. So we would instantly transfer this to Coinbase. Coinbase would convert it to a dollar. Uh, we, you know, and, and so we would. Uh, there was no risk involved in that. And we tried to expand to things like Litecoin and a few other coins. And what we found was that the APIs were super bad in the space. And we thought, like, man, like, you know, Bitcoin access is getting better, and the access to everything else was really bad. And and so that combined, I think, with our passion that said, you know, we didn't know. <laughs> so before we started Bitrix and before we even started Gift Card BTC, but, uh, you know, the, the whole time we were trying to get back into crypto when Richie told me it was going to, Bitcoin was going to hit $1,000, we brainstormed and agonized for months and months and months about how we could get into the industry. And we couldn't, we just weren't smart enough to think about how we could create our own blockchain and make money that way. And so we said, you know what, what we should do is let's create Bitrix and let's make it a place where we can bring all of the innovation and all the deal flow and all of the ideas into one spot. And hopefully that will inspire us to go build our own blockchain. And that's how we're going to go make money. Like we just actually never had an expectation that Bitrix was going to make money. And, uh, and so we are super thankful and fortunate, I think, to all of our customers and to uh, the industry out there that they found what Bitrix provided to be valuable enough that it can be a hundred person company. So, um, but, you know, I, I think that's like the, the two kind of directions that we're hitting this from, which is we were passionate about blockchain and we wanted to support a lot of blockchains. Uh, and we just didn't see a way to do that without building something ourselves. I love it. Bill Shahara, founder and CEO of Bitrex. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, such a perfect way to end thanking the customers. And, you know, as one of your customers, I just want to say thank you. And on behalf of all your other customers, um, keep on keeping on, keep on going you will probably at some point down the road, one of the oldest operating and longest operating crypto companies in the space. And I can't wait to have you back on the show when we can celebrate that, that, that celebration. So again, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of untold stories are released every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. EST on untoldstories.com, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Untold Stories is produced by Jason Yanowitz, Michael E. Polito, Reed Hannaford, and Riley Silbert of Blockworks Group. Our account executives are Gina D. Felice and Julie Muroff. Our content is written by Kathy Zolo, Ronnie Tishner, and Scott Offer. Special thanks to Wayne Dallaire from Jump Dog Audio Productions. And of course, I'm your host, Charlie Shrem. You can follow me on Twitter, at Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation Send me some messages, feedback, or anything you want to say. And remember, please give some love to my sponsors, and I'll see you next week. Remember, strength in numbers and information is power.